We're now up to the anamnesis. So hopefully tonight we'll do anamnesis, the second epiclesis, the intercessions, the doxology, and the great amen, although that seems like it might be unusually ambitious, but, right. but we can see. So let's begin with the anamnesis. The, uh, I'll read the anamnesis in the second and third Eucharistic prayers. Well, actually, I'll read second, third, and fourth. The Eucharistic prayer two is, therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. From the third Eucharistic prayer, therefore, O Lord, we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. And Eucharistic prayer four. Therefore, O Lord, as we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, we remember Christ's death and his descent to the realm of the dead. We proclaim his resurrection and his ascension to your right hand. And as we await his coming in glory, we offer you his body and blood, the sacrifice acceptable to you, which brings salvation to the whole world. So each of the Eucharistic prayers and also Eucharistic prayer one, which I didn't believe, I didn't believe. Ah! Yes. Which I didn't read. Yeah. <laughs> Begins with the therefore. Yes, yeah. So what, why the therefore? Which implies a connection. Right. You're asking about the therefore? Mm-hmm. Well, in each of them before, in the first part of that, the Eucharistic prayers, it's the take this all of you and eat it, of it and drink of it. Put it in the, um, the present tense. Therefore, as we celebrate, instead of the past tense, he took the bread, he took the wine. Now it's in the present tense. Mm -hmm. In the words of consecration, we've been asked to do this in remembrance of me. And so the therefore indicates that we're now doing it in remembrance. So we're, we're, we're presenting to the Father as an assembled congregation, the offering of, of, uh, of Christ. And so we're reaffirming participation in the sacrifice along with the whole church. So the prayer is a cooperation between Jesus, who's the offering, the Holy Spirit, and the worshiping community. We're basically offering back to God the Father what Jesus offered on Good Friday. So on Calvary, Jesus offered his sacrifice alone. And now we're joining in his sacrifice as he offers it to his church. Eucharistic prayer three talks about this holy and living sacrifice. So what is the holy and living sacrifice? It would be Jesus. Anything else? <clears throat> well, it's our sacrifice too. Mm, yeah. It's our sacrifice too. 
since our offering is mixed in with Christ, we are also part of the sacrifice. So we're offering ourselves to be consummated in unity with the Father. The Catechism number 1357 says, we carry out this command of the Lord by celebrating the memorial of the sacrifice. In so doing, we offer to the Father what he has himself given us, the gifts of his creation, bread and wine, which, by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the words of Christ, have become the body and blood of Christ. Christ is thus really and mysteriously made present. So what is the mystery here? really and mysteriously. So we have bread and wine, mm -hmm. which is the appearance. The mystery is that hidden in the bread and wine is the body and blood and of Christ, but also the deeper mystery is that hidden in the bread and wine and the body and blood of Christ is also ourselves. This is an anamnesis. So we discussed more broadly the general meaning of anamnesis as a, a, a remembering that makes the, a past event present, brings it into the present for so that we can participate in, in it and then projects it forward into the future. So that's really a description of the Last Supper. It's in some sense a description of the liturgy of the Eucharist as a whole. And then it's also a description specifically of this short section of the um, of the liturgy of the Eucharist. So how do we see that reflected in the Eucharist, in the, the Eucharistic prayers here? Taking Eucharistic prayer too, therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. So celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, a past event. We offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation. That bread of life and chalice of salvation has been brought into the present and made present for us giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Where is that happening? It's happening in heaven. And so for us, it's a glimpse of a future reality. So that's the anamnesis. In Eucharistic prayer three, therefore, O Lord, we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. So those are historical events that we're celebrating because they're happening now before us. And as we look forward to a second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. So remembrance, the past is brought into the present. So we're offering God the Father, the holy and living sacrifice. And we're looking forward to a second coming. Again, the future dimension. So then we have the second epiclesis, which is the second invocation of the Holy Spirit. In Eucharistic prayer three, humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. In Eucharistic prayer three, 
look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, and filled with this Holy Spirit, they become one body, one spirit in Christ. And in Eucharistic prayer four, look, O Lord, upon the sacrifice which you yourself have provided for your church and grant in your loving kindness to all who partake of this one bread and one chalice that gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, they may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your glory. So in the second epithesis, we're calling on God, on the Holy Spirit for a second time to unite us with Christ's spirit. We're calling for the grace to make ourselves an eternal offering to God. And we're calling for universal unification with the universal church which is reflected in the intercession intercessions that, uh, that follow so we have the first epiclesis and then we have the second epiclesis what is the movement in each one or what, what is the action in each one presence of the holy spirit to, you know, first transform the gifts and then to transform us. Mm -hmm. So in the first one, we're asking that God the Father send his Holy Spirit that the gifts be transformed. So in some sense, so that Christ God the Father is sending his Holy Spirit so that Christ comes to us. In the second epithesis, the bread and wine have already been transformed into the body and blood of Christ. So the sacrifice is present at the altar. <clears throat> so we're asking that God sends his Holy Spirit so that we who receive the Eucharist also be transformed into the body of Christ. So, and we're offering that sacrifice back to God the Father. So the direction in the first one is from God and Christ to us. In the second, it's from Christ and us back to God the Father. So the offering is being presented back to God the Father. And, and so if it were simply only that the gifts were transformed into the body and blood of Christ, be offered back to God the Father, it would be a pointless activity. So the critical element of it is that we're now included so that we are part of the living sacrifice. So the transformation of the bread and wine is for our benefit. God and Christ have no, received no benefit from it. Um, without our participation, it just simply would be a pointless activity. And so, and without our participation, effectively that would mean that Christ is trapped in the Eucharistic species, which makes no sense either. So the point, is that the body of Christ, that Christ be extended bodily to his church, to those assembled, and then as we'll see in intercessions, to um, the church across time and space, 
and indeed possibly, hopefully, as a future promise to all humanity. This is a, this is a fulfillment of, of part of Jesus or an enactment of part of Jesus' high priestly prayer in St. John's Gospel. And so in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. In the high priestly prayer, Jesus is praying as king, as priest, and he's also offering himself as victim. So it's very memorable and theologically significant prayer. So John chapter 17, verse 20. I do not pray for these only. So in the immediate context, he's praying for his disciples, those who are, are present at what is described as the Last Supper, uh, or at the Last Supper where the synoptic gospels have the words of consecration. So I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. They may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, so that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as, as you have loved me. So St. Augustine describes this as the whole assembly and community of, saint, of the saints is offered as a universal sacrifice to God through the high priest who offered himself, the high priest being Jesus. The um, third Eucharistic prayer Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church. Does everyone know what an oblation is? An offering? It's an offering to God. Mm -hmm. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with this Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. That's drawn from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 through 18. Well, that's one chapter before the, uh, the words of institution in, in, you know, 1 Corinthians. Paul writes, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, this is not a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices partners in the altar? And we can stop there. Then in Eucharistic prayer for it, it reads, look, O Lord, upon the sacrifice which you yourself have provided for your church and grant in your loving kindness to all who partake of this one bread and one chalice that gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit. It may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ for the praise of your glory. That's based on Romans. Chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So present your bodies as a living sacrifice. 
he's using sacramental language. And so for our separated brethren, all you have to do is you know, sort of praise God or you know, sort of let out an alleluia. And that's you know kind of good. Um, worship in general is you know, your spiritual worship. But but he's really talking about uh, liturgical worship here, not simply ordinary worship. So then we have the intercessions. How are they can related to the, the second epiclesis? Well, we bring in all the saints in heaven. Now, the author of this book doesn't include Joseph, but um, Mary, Peter, Paul, and all the other apostles, martyrs, and saints. Mm -hmm. It depends on the... Um, Depends on the uh, yeah the version Eucharistic prayer. Right. Actually, I'll read all four of them since the first one does. So remember also, Lord, uh, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, place of refreshment, life, and peace. To us also, your servants, who though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit, admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord, through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. And Eucharistic prayer too. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and Paul, our Archbishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, your spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages. We may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Eucharistic Prayer 3, may he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, your spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. John Vianney, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Paul, our Archbishop, the order of bishops, and all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family who you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, Gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. 
There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. So we, in the epiclesis, <clears throat> we've asked that our sacrifice be combined with that of Christ to be presented back to God the Father. And so now in the intercessions, we make it clear that, that, that what we're combining is not only ourselves, that is to say, those present in the assembly, but rather with the whole church across space and time, and also all those who have died, and particularly our loved ones. So this is a prayer that we be united with the entire church on heaven, in heaven, on earth, in purgatory, with the living, with the dead. And so the mystery here is that although we see ourselves, the entire community of believers across time and space is actually present. So we name a couple of the saints. What is the significance of that? That they are one with us. And it kind of represents all of all of the saints, all of those that have gone before us, and we can't name all of them. Mm -hmm. Right. You can't name all of them. But it makes us aware of their presence, hopefully. So in hearing some of the saints' names, we should recall that all of the saints are present. And, and those, the saints are not only those who have been canonized, but those who are in heaven, which is the you know, sort of more general definition of a saint. What about naming the Pope and the bishop? Why are they named? The Bishop of Rome is the head of the church. What's in the church? Oh, is it, as it says here, isn't it the communion of the local church with all the other churches throughout the world? Mm -hmm. Right. And the person that's the head of the Bishop right. of Rome? We're naming, we're naming the Pope, but because we can't name everyone individually. Although I, I imagine we could, but it would take uh -huh. a little bit longer than people would be willing to stay for mass by a few years. Similarly, the bishop or archbishop is communion of the local church with um, or the communion of, of the, the church over which the archbishop or the bishop um, has authority. So not everybody can be named, but nevertheless, by naming the pope or the archbishop or the bishop there, present, and then also naming, not naming everybody in the world, but nevertheless praying for them. So in Eucharistic prayer three, to advance the peace and salvation of all the world, we're praying that all who come to a knowledge of God. What about prayers for those who have died? This is a major point of contention with most Protestant denominations who find it objectionable and outrageous. So why do we pray for those who have died? Well, they're praying for us. We would hope. What if they're not, I mean, how do we know that they all are? Let's go along with when we say something to do with the the um, 
church is past and future? Those are, that are living are in the future, and those that are that are dead are in the past, are the history. Well, I mean, except you know, that the problem is that those who have, we in fact don't know the fate of those who have died. It's true. And, um, and so there are a number of reasons to pray for the dead. First of all, there's, although not strong biblical evidence for, there's some biblical evidence for it. And, um, in Second Timothy chapter one, starting verse sixteen, Paul writes, "May the the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he refreshed me. He was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me eagerly and found. Me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day." And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. The assumption here is that Onesiphorus has passed away. So Paul is praying for him. He's mm -hmm. praying for a dead person. So that's the biblical evidence. It's also a tradition that is inherited from Judaism. In Judaism, it's called the mourner's kaddish, or the mourner's prayer, where you honor, a, honor and commemorate loved ones who have passed away. And so it's said daily for 11 months after death, and then after that on anniversaries. And so combined with your own good works, it's done for the merit of and for the elevation of the soul the deceased. So then there are also theological reasons to pray for the dead. So first of all, we believe in the resurrection. And so by praying for the dead, as well as ask as interceding for the dead, we show that we do believe in the resurrection. Second, we cannot know the judgments of God, nor is it our, well, presuming to know the judgments of God is the supreme act of arrogance. So we assume that. that those who have died will be with God. It's not our place to assume that they won't be. So we recognize as Romans chapter three, verse 23 says that all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Related to that is we pray for the dead because we hope and we have hope for them. We pray also because we know that prayer can move the hand of God. And then finally, we pray because we love. and love does not die. So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses eight through 13. This is 
And this is the love, love chapter in 1 Corinthians, which is really very well known. But the last part of it typically tends to be missed. This is where Paul talks about if he doesn't have love, love he's a clanging symbol, symbol or and uh, whatever. Uh, then in, in verse 8, he writes, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully even as I have been fully understood. So faith, hope, love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So he's saying that faith, hope, and love are eternal forces. They're forces that cross the bounds of time and space and propel one into, the, into eternity. And the greatest of those three is love. So love is an enduring force that lasts forever and cannot be destroyed. And so because we're a people who love, hopefully, we pray for those who have died. And we also, in praying for those who have died, express our love for those who have died which also indicates that their lives have been made made a difference that they loved and they and they are loved were loved are loved and so our prayer is that that love will prepare all them into the presence of god and into eternity so that's um So that's, uh, I mean, I think those are extremely, extremely powerful reasons um, to pray for those who have died. We also believe in the communion of saints, which, you know, praying for the dead attests to, according to Oregon, praying for the dead attests to the living unity of Christians in heaven and on earth. The, uh, the fathers believed in prayers for the dead. So St. Cyril of Jerusalem talks about prayers for the dead in his catechal lectures. Um, and also all of the pre-Reformation faith traditions, the uh, Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the um, Eastern Orthodox Churches, and the Nestorian Church, or the Church of the East, all pray for the dead. So it's a, a Reformation and post-Reformation uh, tradition to reject prayers for the dead. Then we come to the doxology and the great amen. So the doxology is through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours forever and ever. And the priest does it as he holds up the <coughs> body and blood of Christ. So here, the priest 
in the person of Christ is and representing us with us following him or approaching God the Father through Christ. This doxology dates from the second century, so it's very old. And Driscoll talks about the doxology being an enactment of the creed. Does everyone see that? So the creed has three, four parts. We profess a belief in one God. Or we profess a belief in the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And we profess a belief in one church. And so through him and with him and in him, the him here is Christ. O God, almighty Father, belief in God the Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours forever and ever. What we're offering is the sacrifice of Christ, which not only we as an assembly have been joined, but to which the entire church, crossing time and space, has been joined, united into the single body of Christ. So it's, it is an enactment of the creed. In that he plays a, uh, a really important role in, in the gospels where in many cases, um, the gospel writers present Jesus' ministry as an enactment of Old Testament prophecy or as an enactment of Old Testament psalms. Um, so enactment is very important. And then finally, the great amen. So the doxology is, in, in general, I mean, the general definition of the doxology is a song of praise to God. So the book of Revelation, for example, is, is uh, filled with doxologies, some very beautiful doxologies. So here the priest speaks the doxology. And then we follow with the great amen. So why is it called the great amen? Does anyone have any thoughts? Because it never ends. Right, it never ends. And so we're joining with all of those who have Then in agreement with the doxology across time and space, so all of those in the past, all of those in the present, all of those in the future, wherever they were geographically, St. Jerome reported that when the great amen was sung in Rome, it shook all of the pagan temples. That would indicate that you know it was done with considerable force and and, and fervor, which uh, I think I which uh, seems to be a little bit lacking today sometimes. <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I personally, you know, like to hear the great amen sung very loudly. Yes. Because it should be sung very loudly. Um, yeah. 
because we just witnessed the miraculous and we just joined with all of the saints all of the church across time and space and um and you know so the liturgy of the word ended with the profession of the creed right and so now the liturgy of the Euchar well, the Eucharistic prayer, not the, the liturgy of the Eucharist, continues with the Eucharist. But the Eucharistic prayer ends with our enacting the creed. Mm -hmm. And so we're in in professing the creed, we've joined with all of those across time and space who have ever professed the creed to state what we believe and therefore who we are. And so then in the, in the doxology, we're participating in its, its enactment. We're acting it out with all of those who have also professed it and then acted it out. And so that's um, mind boggling. That is that the past, present, and future dimension of it, the fact that we're joining with others across time and space, that we're present before God is a reason to be um, joyously and vocally and loudly in agreement. That ends the Eucharistic prayer. So next week we'll we'll begin uh, the Eucharistic rite itself or the communion right. Well, I've been told a long time ago by a, a former DRE director of religious said that um, the great amen is when you should offer up your most important things that are most important to you in prayer. But it's not making sense now to me. I mean, or as much sense, I should say. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can, you know, add your, I mean, at some level, you know, you can add your personal intentions at any time. Yeah. But, but the problem is, you know, I mean, especially in the context of pre-Vatican II, you know, there's a, there, there was a tr major tradition of private prayer at mass. You know, so, I mean, it was, I mean, I, I can even distinctly remember, and I think I stopped going to mass when I was about 10. Mm. But, you know, I can remember that people would go to mass and while the mass was going on, they'd be praying their rosaries. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the nuns used to go nuts. If you took out rosaries during the mass. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're kind of and, running down the aisle. You put those away. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> yeah, so so basically, you know, what that really meant is that people were present at mass, but they weren't present at mass. Mm -hmm. Doing their own they thing. Were, they were somewhere off doing their own thing, which is the very antithesis of I mean, they were as good as absent of mass. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were there in body, but not in spirit. And given that mass is, in some sense, the point of the proceeding, that you know becomes a serious absence. <laughs> and and so, I mean, on the one hand, I mean, I, I don't think there were any you know sort of hard and fast rules, but 
we we have to be cognizant that we're worshiping together as a community of believers and not as a collection of individuals. And you know, so you know, particularly for you know particular our particular intentions. The prayers of the faithful are, you know, a good opportunity to add particular people we would like to have prayer for. And that's especially, you know, I mean, that's especially powerful because it's the entire church as a whole, including the communion of saints who's joining in the prayers of the faithful. Um, you know, so in general, and and then you know, there's always the the or in most cases, or at least in, in many parishes, you know, there in the prayers of the faithful, there's the opportunity to lift up your own needs and intentions. So that's a an appropriate place to do it as well. Um, and so I would argue that, you know, although it's not, you know, strictly bad, I, you know, would tend to view it as, you know, a little bit out of sync with, with what's going on. I mean, it, it is, it is, um, and the beauty of the Mass really is that we are joining with all of God's people in a single community, which is mystically present, and um, you know, we can once we, you know, once we begin to understand that, we can begin to see ourselves as being part of that mystical body. And, and we often, and or we can at least sometimes experience ourselves as being part of that mystical body. And we can sometimes experience the fact that we're worshiping God before the throne of God and not merely in our church. So that's, that's really very, very important. Thank you. Uh, the communal dimension. Well, every week mass just gets better and better, I think. You know, put in the context of everything we've read, you know, talked about and read in the book. Yeah. It's to be more and more, oh, what's the word, vibrant. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. More uh, yeah, vibrant is, is a good word. More alive, more meaningful, and it, it tends to transform the mass from being you know sort of the same meaningless ritual to being profoundly meaningful, yeah. having multiple layers of meaning, and yeah. it also speeds up the mass. Ha. Yeah. So that it doesn't, you know, it seems to just go by too quickly. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I, I frequently find that the mass just goes by too quickly. Besides being a time of excitement, it's also a time of peace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 